As the US and Europe confront Iran in talks about its nuclear program, the diplomatic tensions between Iran and Israel remain at boiling point with threats of an attack on the Islamic Republic by the Jewish state. Israel has vowed that any nuclear activity by Iran is unacceptable, and there's one expression that is continuously invoked by the Israeli leadership in order to justify its claims that Iran is an existential threat. They're the leaders of Iran who call for a new Holocaust and vow to wipe Israel off the map. This idea that uh, Iran wants to wipe Israel out. As we know, Ahmadinejad didn't say that he plans to exterminate Israel. It, they didn't say we'll wipe it out, you're right, but it will not survive. It is a cancerous tumor that should be removed, was said just two weeks ago again. Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, we analyze the words and issues central to the dispute between Israel and Iran, and we're doing so in Jerusalem in conversation with Israel's Minister of Intelligence and Atomic Energy, Deputy Prime Minister Dan Meridor. First of all, Dan Meridor, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Nice to be with you, Al Jazeera. Let me begin with your particular position. You are Minister of Intelligence and Atomic Energy. Um, you have uh, a past in intelligence uh, and a great deal uh, of focus on a number of ex one of one of your previous roles was to focus on external threat I believe which is an interesting idea so I want to talk a little bit about that but let's start with the question of Iran because your background and your present position makes you I suppose one of the uh, more informed and key players in Israel's thinking about Iran now Shaul Mofaz the new Kadima head has said that Benjamin Netanyahu is overemphasizing and uh, overplaying the threat from Iran. Netanyahu seems to believe that Iran is, is a major uh, existential threat. Which side are you on? Well, I, I take Iran uh, as what they say and what they do. Uh, Iran is the only country on earth uh, who says openly, recently repeated, Israel should not exist. The last metaphor they used, I think it was Ahmadinejad this time, it's a cancerous tumor that should be removed from the Middle East. It's not a very uh, uh, sympathetic way to look upon us. They say it again and again. They introduce something to uh, the conflict of which we are a part that never exists in the past. They introduce religion into it. They make it not a political issue. They say it's against our religion that a non-Muslim state will be here. And this makes all the conflict uh, much less uh, possible to be resolved. On top of that, the attempt of Iran to uh, export the revolution to take their own uh, words, mainly in the Arab world, uh, have really uh, caused a lot of anxiety. In most Arab regimes, you might have seen Wikileaks, uh, if you have no other sources, to see what they think of Iranian domination. And the attempt of a regime that uh, think they know better and they have a direct line to God, which we simple human beings don't have, and they have an ideology in which Israel should not exist in the end, and the Arab world should be much more pious and religious. And then they want to have a nuclear uh, military force, as the Atomic Energy Agency of the UN just said. This is a unique combination that doesn't leave us uh, totally indifferent. Well, let's, let's examine the elements of that. Now, you started off by saying you judge them by what they do, and yet everything that you have just said is nothing more than rhetoric, is nothing oh, no, more than no. phraseology. Oh, no. So well, well, let's, let, let's take each, each one. Let's say, but it's uh, not what they do. Let's take, let's take each one as it comes. Now, this okay. idea that uh, Iran wants to wipe Israel out. Now, that's a, a common trope that is put about by uh, a lot of people in Israel, a lot of people in the United States. But as we know, Ahmadinejad didn't say that he plans to exterminate Israel, um, nor did he say that Iran policy is to exterminate Israel. Ahmadinejad's position and Iran's position always has been, and they've, they've made this, they've said this as many times as Ahmadinejad has criticized Israel. He has said as many times that he has no plans to attack Israel. He's simply said that if you hold a referendum in this part of the world with everybody who lives here, he will accept the outcome of that referendum. Well, I, I happen to disagree with all due respect. You speak of Ahmadinejad. Disagree speak with of, what? I speak of Khamenei, Ahmadinejad, Rafsanjani, Shamkhani. I give the names of all these people. 
they all come basically ideologically, religiously to the statement that Israel uh, is an unnatural creature. It will not survive. It, they didn't say we'll wipe it out, you're right, but it will not survive. It is a cancerous tumor just to be removed was said just two weeks ago again. Well, uh, for, for so what I'm, this I'm, is I'm glad you've acknowledged that they didn't say they will wipe it out because they so many Israeli politicians... They said it needs to be removed. Yes, th this is they said, that, they said that it will cease to exist no, no, it, in, it, it, in, in a historical in, in context. A this is what they said. They want to... Israel should not exist here. It's non-legitimate. Not the borders, not the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, not Jerusalem, not refugees. Israel is unnatural. It will not exist. It's on the verge of collapse. When you hear this from uh, uh, these people, uh, you need to take it seriously. But I think you'll agree that saying Israel is on the verge of collapse is nothing like saying that we are planning to wipe Israel out, whether we have weapons they or not. Le let, me, let, me, let me provide a bit of context here. Your own foreign minister, Avigdor Lieberman, uh, said only two or three years ago that his preferred way of dealing with Palestinians was the way that the US dealt with Japan during World War II, as we know. The U.S. dropped I nuclear bombs on Japan during World War II. I now, the point I'm trying to make here is that rhetoric from politicians in domestic contexts is not necessarily a reason to conflate uh, an international political position. Is it? Well, thank you for your uh, answer. Can I ask a question now? I thought you were asking questions. I don't think uh, Lieberman ever said this. I don't remember having heard him ever saying anything of that sort. But leave that aside, when we hear repeatedly the sentence said again and again, Israel is not legitimate, should not exist, again and again. And using all those metaphors, I can give you more of these if you like, it's quite clear. To say don't take it seriously, it's just rhetoric, is wrong. From 1967, from the Six Days War, we haven't heard any more in any Arab country the sort of rhetoric. Until 67 years, the thought will not exist, will be wiped off the map, yes. The only one that uh, reintroduced this rhetoric that should not be taken uh, easily and lightly is Iran. And with it, Hezbollah after that, of course, Syria doesn't say it for one. Iran said it again and again. And then if they say it, and then they continue uh, to pile up, uh, you speak of deeds, uh, um, uranium that they enrich, and they build missiles that they build in big numbers and have a military nuclear plan, as the UN uh, said just in November. If you put all this together, uh, and if you are a responsible leader, you can't say, oh, they don't really mean it. Uh, I don't want to go back to history, but we heard many times, they can't mean it, what they say about the Jews. They can't mean it. They don't really mean it. People of, of normal behavior would not do it. We can't take this as uh, easily as that. But, but again, my question that I started with was, political rhetoric from Iran and their ideological belief that Israel is not a legitimate entity. Is that a reason for you to believe that somehow they pose an existential threat? And if I so, think, I think that in what form? I, I think that the role that Iran plays in the uh, Middle East regarding not only us, but we included in that <coughs> is a policy that will not support, which they never did, peace with Israel. For example, we had peace with Egypt 34 years ago, Begin Sadat. Who objected to this? Iran. Who named a street in Tehran after the men who killed Sadat, who made peace? Iran. So they not only theoretically say something or historically uh, give some observation. They say that peace with Israel is not legitimate. They attack those who make peace with us, like Jordan and Egypt. And they are very active in trying to, um, to arm and, uh, and uh, help those who fight us uh, very, very severely, like Hezbollah, Hamas, and others. And they all put all this together and not understand what it means is somewhat strange. I don't think there's any other country on earth against which there is such a statement repeatedly. It should not exist. But your prime minister has gone to the United States, has uh, built up uh, a degree of international conversation, some would say a degree of international fury, to the point where everyone is convinced that Israel's plan is to attack Iran. I'm still trying to find the logical connection between a country that voices its opinion politically and the Prime Minister's belief that that necessarily equates to an existential threat. It is not just rhetoric. <clears throat> so don't, don't uh, play down rhetoric. In the word rhetoric, uh, uh, in rhetoric you say what you want. And if you take action, trying to... But this is why I keep asking you, can you, can you 
draw the lines for me, to join yes, the dots I between I, I don't know. the rhetoric it's, and, and yeah, the yes. threat. This rhetoric is not just another rhetoric. Can you give me one example of one country on Earth, one member of the United Nations on Earth, who says in the, against another member of the United Nations, it should not exist, and gets away with it? This is only we and only they. We never said Iran should not exist. There should be a referendum in Iran between Azeris and the Iran. We never said this. They have this uh, uh, rhetoric repeated with all sorts of tricks and, and, and games, but the, the essence is very clear. Let's, let's address the issue of Iran getting nuclear weapons. You're, you're talking about it as if that is indeed what Iran is aiming for and uh, plans to do. I, I just say what the UN said. The a number of high-level people in the United States, including the Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, including uh, uh, General Clapper, who is the head of intelligence services, including all of the American uh, intelligence services, have concluded that Iran has not made a decision to have a nuclear weapon. No, what they said, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, is that Iran is going after nuclear weapons. They haven't made the decision yet to move the last step. They are waiting. The, the, the Supreme Leader has to make this decision. But the general uh, understanding between us and America, I think, and, and Europe, England, France, Germany, is uh, with no, no doubt whatsoever that Iran has made a decision to go there. They have made a decision to take the final step now. The fact is that they continue to enrich against the UN resolution and so forth. They continue to build missiles on the weapon system. They had a plan up to 2003. And since that day, by the UN report, not our report, they have, I think, four or five experiments and researches that can be explained by the UN, by Mr. Amano, only as aiming at weapons. They haven't made the final decision, but they are preparing for this and they are building it up. This is what the world wants to stop. And I think this is... Well, you, you keep, there may you keep, be some differences keep, between us you and keep, America, you keep but talking, not on you, this. You keep talking about the world. And uh, in fact, it's, as I said, a, a very large number of countries around the world, probably a majority of them, have no problem with Iran's nuclear program. It's just a number of states that support your position that have a problem with it. But, is that, uh, is that, that a question or a statement? It's a statement, more or less, because I, we... But, but let, me, let me quote to you Paul Pilar, who's the veteran uh, Middle East CIA analyst, um, on the issue that you just mentioned, which is missiles. He says the intelligence community does not believe Iran is anywhere near close to having an ICBM. The Federation of American Scientists has said the same thing. Uh, the Arms Control Association has said the same thing. I think the Israeli uh, intelligence community, the American, the British, the French, the German, I can number many more countries have no difference whatsoever on the, on the facts, which are Iran has now over 400, 450 missiles that can reach not only Israel, but more than Israel. They are building even more than that. You can hear it from everybody. They don't yet have a nuclear warhead. That is true. This is what they are aiming at. The, I, Iran is continuing to build those missiles in a, in a remarkable pace. They continue to build more missiles, which are longer range. They continue to reach uranium above what they could ever need for any other thing, including over five and a half tons of low enriched uranium and 110 kilograms of 20% enriched uranium. And they are doing that in breach of their commitments on the NPT and other things, as the UN has said several times. Let's move it forward then and examine the consequences of Iran actually having a nuclear weapon. What do you think they would be? I would think that in the first place, if, if things develop, the way they, uh, they may develop, because I hear the others saying, Saudi says we'll get nuclear weapons if they do. Uh, other countries may have the same idea. I have some names in mind. I don't want to mention them here. We may start a nuclear race in the world, which it didn't have for many, many years. Well, I mean, you, you, may, not, you may not want to name them, but uh, I will, because one of, one of the Israeli journalists wrote in the New York Times only recently, he named Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt. Um, uh, and in response to that, uh, Stephen Cook, who's uh, on the Council for Foreign Relations in the United States, as you've probably read only a couple of days ago, wrote an article thoroughly debunking and, and saying there is no reason to believe that there is a proliferation risk across the Middle East. All right. So I, I will go back to what I said. I heard uh, it is said by not only the Saudis, Egyptians used to say it openly. Uh, interestingly, if Iran gets nuclear, we get nuclear. I heard this from many people, including the most important people in the intelligence community and political people in Britain, in, in the United States, in France, in many other countries. I think that the standoff between Iran and America in the Muslim world is a sort of culture camp, a clash of civilizations. And some groups that are not nationally based, but religiously based, called them Al-Qaeda or Jihad or Taliban or others, 
who think that this is a way to stop the West and the, those ideas and domination of the West will have a real boost in the victory of Iran over those Westerners that are trying to, to, to change the course that they think is the historical course of the victory of the, their interpretation of Islam. I think it's dangerous, I think it's bad, I think it's the wrong way. So this has nothing to do with Israel, all that I said now. It changes the, 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 the uh, uh, rules of the game that we know. Well, of course, I mean, for I mean, us, I'm interested that you're phrasing it this way. Of course, because, of course, because, for us, because a lot of people believe exactly what you're saying, that in fact the problem that um, Israel, that America has with Iran mostly, and Iran's um, neighbors have actually is nothing to do with uh, a real military threat or a nuclear problem. It's the fact that naturally they would like to prevent Iran from actually having any political influence in the region. This is nothing more than a, a fight over um, political ascendancy more than anything else. Well, you see, it's a, all a question of words. I never said any political influence. Iran is an important country. Iran is a very ancient civilization, a very proud civilization, a very successful nation until 79, part of the West, the science and technology. From 79, what befell them is something different, of course. And I have nothing, and we have nothing against the Iranian people. They were, can I say, best friends of us for many years. From the time that the, this regime uh, came to power after the uh, coup of 79 with the fall of the Shah and the Shahpur Bakhtiar attempt that didn't succeed, uh, God came in with his, with his uh, 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 people that supposedly speak for him the way they put it. And they changed the nature of Iran into something much more sinister from our point of view. And I don't have any problem with Iran. If Iran says that, that the Arab world is not acting right and they want to change the regime in their world and they want of course to see Israel being eliminated this is an influence they shouldn't have I agree but it's not that they shouldn't have an influence there is yeah, that eliminated nation. word again important nation I have no problem with Iran I have problem with the with the policy with the capabilities but is Israel was friendly with Iran even after Khomeini came in uh, Israel and Iran cooperated very nicely during the Iran Contra affair uh, orchestrated by the Reagan administration, I, Israel was selling arms to Iran well, well after the Islamic Revolution. Well, I, I, I must say I was not in government those days and I can't tell you. you I, I read the stories. I don't want to say no, yes, I don't know, maybe. But for the, so we, we really had very good relationship with the Iranian people for many years and we are not, we are not choosing that. If people want to live with us and want to, to have commerce with us, to talk with us, we always are ready. But Iran has taken a position, unique position in the world against our very existence and is very, very active in helping and, and, and is providing all our worst enemies and building the, an army on our, the northern border of Israel called Hezbollah, aiming 50,000 rockets at us. This is something that one cannot overlook. And we see this danger developing and we see the rhetoric coming and we see the policy and we see the statements to this very day and we hear the, the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency saying, yes, they are going for a nuclear weapon and we cannot the, the look IAEA the other way. has not said that. I mean, sorry oh, to interrupt. They had, they had, no, November wrote, they said exactly this, that they were after nuclear weapons. This is the word, nuclear weapons. Iran was, had a plan for nuclear weapons, described the plan very well. In 2003, there was a change. If, 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 if I may, they say. If I may the IAEA report actually stated unequivocally that there had been no evidence of any diversion of nuclear materials towards a weapons program. They cited a few cases of concern over uh, experiments that they thought might be have dual use capacity. There was, as you you have you have said, the IAEA has stated unequivocally that Iran is making a nuclear weapon. No, that, that is not what they said. The UAIA said unequivocally, Iran had a plan for nuclear weapons. No problem about that. They had said in 2003 they changed it, and since that day they dispersed the group, the weapons group, I think the word is. They held, I think, four or five experiments. And dual use is, is a word they use, but when you go for some of these projects, they can be explained, says the IAEA, only in that way. Iran has proposed uh, an alternative strategy that might actually do away with all of this. It's a strategy that other people have also endorsed, and that is the idea of an entirely nuclear-free Middle East, which would involve Israel joining the conversation and giving up its own nuclear weapons program, and that would solve all our problems, wouldn't it? I think you're, you're a minimalist. You want a nuclear-free uh, Middle East. I want a nuclear-free world. Why should you be limit yourself that much? We wish for the day when there won't be nuclear weapons in the world, but we are not yet there. It's interesting, as I said, that you know the Arab but countries. But Iran is committed to the idea I mean, of a nuclear-free Middle East. Would would Israel let, give let up me, its nuclear let, let arsenal? Me, let me let me let uh, me 
say to you the following. You know that uh, many countries, including Arab countries, including some of our enemies, those who still remain uh, our enemies, uh, think that we have nuclear weapons. We never said yes or no to that. None of them ever said, because Israel has it, we'll develop our own nuclear weapons. When they hear Iran is going to get nuclear weapons, they say, if Iran has it, we have it. What does it mean? It means well, that I know, uh, let, me, let me answer the question that I put. It means that they, their enemy is not Israel. The danger to their regime does not come from Israel. Otherwise, they would have said something else. They don't say it. They know that the danger for their stability, for their regimes, for their way of life, comes from this nuclear Iran as a major threat for the, the order of this region, and maybe not only this region. So we are now focused on that. And I think that the way to prove that everything is fine and we are all wrong is in the hands of Iran. They start now the talks in some days with the five plus one, with the six countries. And uh, I think that if they uh, want to step down from this idea that they had and maybe still have, I think they still have to get the nuclear weapons, they can take steps that will be demanded, not to convince me, convince the Saudis. It's better. Tell them and show them, prove to them that you're not going after nuclear weapons. When they say that they are satisfied, come to me. Let me quote you the former Mossad chief, Ephraim Halevi. You have to remember that Iranians have been treated very badly by the international powers going back to the days of World War II. You have to start creating trust with your enemy. Agree with yeah. no you agree with that? I agree that uh, we, and yet, we and, yet, and, yet, and yet we're going into this next round of talks uh, in exactly the same mode, um, many of the themes of which you have just echoed, and that is it is entirely incumbent on Iran only to prove a negative, which is that it doesn't intend to do this. Why, why is it not more sensible, rather than have your prime minister threatening war, have uh, an attempt by the international uh, Western powers, Western-backed powers, to drum up this anti-Iran campaign, to actually go there and have a dialogue, as a fo your own former Mossad chief has suggested? Well, I think that Iran, as I said, is an important nation in the Middle East, like Israel, like Turkey, like all the Arab countries. And all of them have a right to exist here. And nobody but Iran doubts no other country but the existence of Israel. I think this is something that cannot be a background or, or, or a base for talks. Is it not time for Israel to abandon this strange strategy of neither denying nor confirming its own nuclear program, for it to admit what everybody knows, that Israel has the biggest nuclear weapons store in the Middle East, and to join the non-proliferation treaty and to lay itself open to the same procedures that it demands of Iran? The answer is simple, no. I think our policy is sound and good, and I think uh, it does not bother anybody seriously. And you see, as I told you, although you don't uh, seem to be very uh, welcoming, uh, this response that no Arab country ever threatened to get nuclear weapons because they think we have it. But they all, or many of them, say we will not allow Iran to have it. Think of it. Well, this, it's, uh, you, this political strategic uh, alliance against Iran is something that has been generated for a particular strategic purpose. Now, the fact that Saudi Arabia will, at the insistence uh, of, of the strategic necessity, make comments like that, I don't think necessarily is, is taken as convincing evidence by the rest of the world that there will be a nuclear arms race. I've quoted to you Stephen Cooker, the Council for Foreign Relations, who is n by no means the only senior international relations expert who thinks that this is not going to happen. Well, no, I'm not a prophet. Although we come from a land of prophets, I'd never take uh, the, uh, the audacity to give you any prophecy. Well, I mean, the, I mean, the, 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 the only, the only reason I bring it up is I'm because we're having this circular conversation in which, in which you're making claims with, with nothing more uh, to back them up other than other people's commentary. And I'm wondering where this is actually going to lead us because the world is now sitting here waiting to see if there's going to be another war in the Middle East. And the world believes uh, almost overwhelmingly that if there is, it would be catastrophic for this part of the world. So t tell me your opinion. If there is a war in the Middle East, either instigated by uh, Israel, by the United States, or by any one of the Arab neighbors, do you think that the consequences of that will be a safer Israel or a more insecure Israel? I don't want to see a war developing in the Middle East. We don't need a war. We need Iran to step down from the nuclear ambitions. That's simple. Uh, this is as simple as that. And I think that... Uh, but if there were to be a war... There shouldn't be a war. It's in the hands of Iran, nobody else. It's not me. It's the President of the United States who said that uh, if nothing else helps, all options on the table, including a military option. 
Uh, Secretary Panetta who said this. It's the Brits and the French and others who said this. We didn't, we, it's, not, it's not about us now. And I think that in the hand of Iran to prove that they are not there, and everything will be looked different. But why do you think that if it's so easy, if Iran is not there on the track for military capability, why don't they do anything about this? Do they want to take the risk? Yeah, we will leave it. Thank you very much indeed, Sophie. Thank you. Pleasure to talk.